Uh, we're really looking forward to talking with you today about work that we've been doing to lead the AU Cornerstone Madrid SIS Scholars Program over the last two years, together in partnership with uh, my colleagues in uh, the study abroad office. Uh, we really want to emphasize and, and share the ways in which campus-wide partnership bring to light the, the possibilities for new programs or improvements on existing services or programs that, that we have here at the university. Um, so this is a, a case study then for, for our purposes today of cross-campus collaboration. And I'm joined today by... Hi everyone, my name is Emma Bozik jarvis I am an assistant director for the AU Centers in the AU Abroad Office. And please do let us know as we navigate this hybrid setup for presenting, if you need us to be louder, if you're not catching one of us, um, if you are commenting into the chat, oh, getting a little feedback, maybe off of yours, uh, um, I, you might have to just jump in and interrupt because we're both operating on single screens, so we may not be able to see, see your chats. All right, so what is on the agenda for today? We're going to talk with you about uh, the program, introduce you to what it is and about. Uh, how we uh, approached thinking about what this program could be, what the genesis of it was, the people involved in it. Uh, and then we're going to be pretty frank about some of the challenges that we encountered along the way. This is a two-year-old program or, or really about to enter into its second cohort. So depending on where you you start that, that clock, uh, we've got a couple of of years of development and one year of implementation uh, that we're able to talk with you about. And then we'll draw from those challenges and successes some takeaways that uh, we hope that you'll be able to apply into your work uh, and that might inspire you in thinking about work that you could undertake in the future. Okay, so what is the SIS Madrid Scholars Program? It is a first of its kind program here at AU. It is an opportunity that allows students to have an international experience during their first year at AU and sort of more importantly, during that very first semester as an AU student. And they're gonna spend that semester at the AU Center in Madrid. It is a cohort-based program. So it's really important for us that our students develop a sense of community and a really strong sense of place, just like they would if they were on campus here at AU. Part of that cohort experience is really figuring out kind of the Goldilocks in terms of the size of the cohort. You want a cohort that is small enough that students feel like, I really know all of my peers on this program. We're more than just classmates. Um, we're really having this once in a lifetime opportunity together. But you don't want it to be so small that you narrow down the experiences that students are coming from, their identities, their backgrounds. Being able to meet new people is such like a hallmark of the college experience. And so we really wanted to make sure that the cohort size give students a chance to be a community, but be exposed to people from all different walks of life. So that sweet spot we got to is between 20 and 25 students on this program. Um, overall, I think of the program as really a jumpstart. It's a jumpstart for students to have an international educational experience, but it's also a jumpstart for confidence building, I think. Confidence in themselves to take on new challenges and also to just be a student who is able to explore the many options they're gonna have here at AU when they're back on campus too. Mm -hmm. um, so they're gonna earn AU credit throughout their semester on the program. Uh, they're gonna take core courses that help with their uh, you know, habits of mind requirements. They're going to um, be studying language while they're there and also taking courses that will apply to their SIS major. So it's really a sound academic semester. It sets them up to succeed as a first year student, but across their undergraduate education. And then financial aid also applies, and we'll get into that a little bit later. And obviously a very important topic for first year students and their families. And so the curriculum that the students are undertaking, I think reflects the principles that both we would have uh, for our students on, on our main campus, but also that the study abroad uh, a team commits to when they send a student on any study abroad semester, that this is a real intensive academic experience in which a student is, is learning and, and learning 
uh, through coursework uh, that has been articulated to be equivalent to that of, of what a student might uh, take here on campus. Um, so coinciding with what Emma described, uh, during their, their study abroad semester, these students are taking courses that advance their progress towards their AU core requirements, which is our general education program here on campus. So they're taking their Writing 100. Um, if they've already satisfied Writing 100 through AP or IB credit or other exam credit, then we have an alternative for them. Um, and uh, then they're also taking from a suite of classes uh, in the SIS major. So they're taking a first year seminar that's been specially developed for these students. Uh, they're taking SISA 103, International Migration and Refugee Crises, which is for one of their regional credits towards the major and Econ 200. And every student is taking Spanish, um, which is able to be offered at all levels. So when you look at these range of courses, you're getting a sense that uh, this is a, a quite prescribed curriculum, and that is by design because we do really want these students to have um, an experience that is cohorted in nature. So these students are taking uh, nearly every one of these courses together as a cohort, um, but they're also then able to have the flexibility that re uh, reflects the different backgrounds that these students have, such that a student is possibly bringing in credit that might have otherwise satisfied Econ 200 or they're writing 100. And so they're able to find alternative options. And in fact, I don't know if this is one of the things that we talk about in the, the challenges or the sort of refinements to the program later, but continuously having to be uh, creative thinkers about how we can do that as more and more students have more and more transfer credits that they're coming into college with. So then when those students are, are coming back to, to uh, campus or coming to campus really for the first time, they're able to continue on with many of those courses that our students are taking in their first years because we are very uh, deliberately thinking about that academic progression and wanting to keep them on time. So they're taking the second half of that Writing 100, Writing 101 sequence or Writing 106 if they had AP credit. They're taking their AU experience course, which is their uh, transition to college course, their complex problem seminar 105. Um, and they're doing all of this for the, the spring semester in the context of a living learning community, which we'll talk a little bit about more. Um, and we'll talk about some of the refinements to the schedule too, as we continue on. And just one thing to add to about um, the academics, which I think speaks really to the foundation that was in place at AU Madrid. When you're looking at these courses, we didn't have to reinvent the wheel because AU Madrid already had such an academic um, foundation. So what it really was was like making the wheel specialized for this program. So when you're talking about a course like SISA 103, AU Madrid had an upper level migration course. And the faculty is so really, you know, tuned in with the campus faculty and SIS, they were able to work together to say, okay, how do we tailor this for this new group of students? And I think that just speaks to like why AU Madrid was chosen, but also how the academics were able to sort of come together so seamlessly. Those foundations were in place and the collaboration between AU Madrid and SIS already existed. So I think that really helped. So housing, obviously academics is important, but students' everyday life really comes into play. And it's such an important part of their experience. I know when I think back to university and starting as a first year student, I was like so excited to go to the dorms and decorate and you know shopping for what my room would look like. Obviously that experience is gonna be super unique to these first year students on the program. And so we're not able to perfectly replicate what an AU dorm experience would be, but what we're able to do is still provide them with that sense of community by all living together in a purpose-built student residence in Madrid. It's called Reza. It's an organization that we've partnered with for many years for our upper level students that study at AU Madrid. And it offers them the sense of being all together in a community, they're sharing meals in the cafeteria, they're engaging with each other. Um, so it's kind of that best of both worlds. There's, it feels like a dorm, but it's also really authentic to what a Spanish university experience would be. Oftentimes in Europe, you know, there aren't dorms attached to universities. It'd be like if there was a dorm in D.C. that housed AU, GW, Howard students. And instead of everyone going to class together in the morning, you go to your respective universities. And that's what Reza setup looks like. Students have their own um, rooms in Reza. They're private. Um, it's also a really great experience for students because 
We have such a great working relationship with the rest of staff. We can check in with them, make sure our students are doing well. We've also been really lucky to add a program assistant to the AU Madrid staff just for this program. She has lived in Reza, so she understands student life. She is, I kind of think of her as like a professional peer. She's a professional, but she's a little bit younger and can engage with the students in a way where maybe they put up walls to some of the um, more experienced staff members. Um, another really important part of building community during that first year and first semester for students is always just the opportunity to engage in everyday life. So whether that's you know, seeing people in the study rooms or walking down to dinner together. And again, we can't replicate the AU experience, but we can have that in Reza. Reza has study spaces and lounge spaces where students can gather. It has rec areas, it has outdoor areas, it has a pool. So <laughs> like, it's just like a really great experience for students and it still provides them with elements that make the college experience so exciting when you're getting that first taste of independence. It's also great because it has local students there. So they are integrating with local Spanish students from across Spain, from across the EU, who are studying in Spain and living in Reza. There are also other North American study abroad programs who use Reza as a housing partner. So not only are our students, again, in that cohort in community, but they're able to have deeper relationships um, with people in, from Spain, from North America, and really broaden their network. Excursions, this is the, like the most fun part for students. So experiential learning is kind of a pillar of AU Madrid. It's really a pillar of the experience of all of our centers. And Madrid becomes the classroom for our students, right? Spain becomes the classroom. It's about giving students an opportunity to have place-based learning beyond the traditional classroom experience. That is no different for students on the program. So the AU Madrid team has been super thoughtful about how they integrate experiential learning into these student semesters. It involves a lot of little opportunities to engage locally and culturally. So each week students have paseos, which are like their walking tours. They're able to explore the city, check out different museums, they go to cultural activities. So whether it's like a paella class or a flamenco class, which I have joined them on before, and it's very fun, but very humbling <laughs> experience to do that with the students. Um, but really giving them a chance to explore and but also explore in terms of relation, how it relates to their coursework. So then there are longer academic excursions that give students a chance to take what they are learning in the classroom in maybe that more traditional setting and see how it's actually impacting the world around them to experience historical sites, go to museums together. I said earlier that I think the program is a big confidence builder in some ways. And I think this experiential aspect is a huge part of that. So students come with a bunch of different backgrounds, right, and experiences. And what having this experiential element does is it gives students a chance to explore and engage with a different culture, but within that framework and kind of that safety net of the AU Madrid staff that are there helping them, sort of walking along with them in that experience. And hopefully as they do that, they get a little emboldened and feel like they can explore further. You know, whether that's in Spain, when they come back to campus, it just helps them know that like they have the tools and the confidence to go out there and engage in different opportunities. And I think that particularly matches the needs of students in this moment, coming out of COVID, of, of having the experience of, of a slightly uh, less advanced social uh, experience, that the building up of their, their sense of self-agency, of their self-efficacy through an experience like this with the structure that it provides specifically, recognizing that they need uh, that guided support to, to do so creates the conditions where that's really possible. So why was this program created? Uh, is a, a question that I think uh, comes from a number of different directions. And there are sort of three different pieces of this that I'll talk about. Uh, the conversion of new students, the retention of first year students and space constraints. And many of these are very practical, but we'll come back around to the, the really intellectual and uh, values-based reasons. Additionally, why these uh, pieces come together with uh, our motivations for, for bringing uh, this program online. So uh, very candidly, this program uh, is uh, one that is 
not unfamiliar in the market, but is differentiated from what is available uh, at other universities. So we know that uh, in the conversion of new students in this uh, uh, enrollment cliff that, that was talked about this morning and which we, we continuously hear more and more about in higher education news circles, we're looking for what makes AU stand out apart, uh, from other institutions. We already know that study abroad is one of those differentiators here at American University. We know that experiential learning is as well. What is uh, additionally unique about this program and in bringing in these qualities is that these are fully matriculated students. So we know that uh, at a lot of other institutions, a program like this would be offered as a conditional admit. A student has to participate at a study abroad site. And then, uh, then once they've completed that experience, they can come to campus and be fully matriculated students. Students in AU Cornerstone Madrid are fully matriculated from the moment they start in this program. Um, and I do think that that is, is one of the, the qualities that really sets apart uh, this, um, not only because of the, the full commitment that we're making to those students and we're saying that if you would like this experience, if you think you would be successful in this experience, we welcome you to it. Um, but on the other hand, if you decide you want to come to main campus, you are welcome there too. That ability to move between those as a choice is, is something that I think really speaks to our values. The retention of first year students, we know that these kinds of small cohort experiences are ones that contribute to students forming that deeper sense of community. We talked again this morning, picking up on many of these themes of connection. It's not only connection to faculty and staff, but it's to each other and finding the spaces and the places in which they find uh, that they uh, feel a sense of, of connection, of uh, validation, um, and of, of interest and intrigue. They're searching for what sparks their curiosity and, and what's uh, capitalizing on, on that uh, imagined sense of self that they had for themselves when they thought about attending college. And then uh, space constraints. Um, as many of you may be aware, the university is under a housing cap with our neighborhood. And so there is always an interest uh, when we are trying to fully uh, capitalize on, on our abilities to uh, bring in as many students as we can within those constraints under the best conditions for those students to be successful. So this was an opportunity for us to have a population of students offsite and to sort of lighten that, that load, particularly recognizing that uh, spring tends to be the semester when uh, upper class students are more interested in studying abroad. So while a small cohort, this does help as a piece of that puzzle to offsetting some of that imbalance in the residence halls. Go for it. So <laughs> existing structure. Um, I think what Brad said earlier is something that's really unique about the program is that idea that our students are fully matriculated AU students when they decide to go on this program. It's not conditional. What also makes it really unique is we know there are other first year programs out there, first semester programs out there. A lot of those programs might partner with foreign universities. They might use a study abroad provider to house their program. Those can be great options. AU Madrid is AU. So sometimes when you have those first semester programs abroad, some of the culture or maybe the values of your home institutions don't quite translate, or they might get lost in sort of translation or the soft of it all. And with AU, the AU Madrid staff is part of this AU family, right? They visit us here on campus. They meet with faculty members. They're meeting with deans. They're really engaged. And so they have a really profound understanding of what it means to be a student on AU's campus. They bring that with them to AU. Um, Madrid. And so our students have a more seamless understanding of sort of the connection between the two sites while also having an intercultural experience. And I think that makes it really unique. As I mentioned earlier, the infrastructure was already in place academically to be able to have a sound semester where we weren't starting from scratch, but we were specializing and sort of prioritizing the needs of this particular group of students where courses already existed on site and could be tweaked, great where we needed to work across departments, work with SIS to create new courses with the core to kind of figure out how to make that make sense for students um, throughout their degree progression in that first semester, we were able to do that. 
Um, as I said before, the on-site staff really makes such a difference in this experience for students. The AU Madrid team has been doing this for many, many years. The faculty there, the staff there, have been running our upper um, class student programs for so long. They have a great sense of what AU students are looking for on a semester abroad. It's a little bit different for the first year, but they have that foundation, which can't be replaced um, if you're not necessarily on an AU program. The other big part that allows students to feel like they're still part of the AU community is the fact that during the fall semester, there are three other AU Madrid programs running alongside this first year program for the scholars. We have students studying from COGOT, SIS students, um, students that are taking courses in public health, all there for the fall. Students have the opportunity to interact with them. So the first year students can chat with upper level or upper class students about their AU experiences. They can take some courses with them, maybe for the language or the art history class. And so it really does feel like they are an eagle who has an opportunity to be with other eagles while they're still having this really unique first semester experience. Sure. Um, so there obviously are have been huge benefits for our students. Um, academically, students have been super engaged, and we'll get into a little bit more like the number side of that and how well these students are doing. But the program itself really does increase student engagement, like when they get back. We're already seeing from the first cohort um, engaging with our office in different ways. Just, you know, they just wrapped up their first year and they're already kind of asking us like, well, what's next? And so I think that, that speaks to how, um, up, like the profound impact the program had on them. Um, and like I said, we'll get into the numbers in terms of the actual academic performance. Um, but the gains that our students have on this program is invaluable. Like it's not just the academic experience they're having, but the intercultural experience. The fact that we have students who um, have that jump start to the international education, where right now we have first year students who did this program in fall 23, they've interviewed for some internships and stuff. And already on their resume, people are like, oh, you've already had this international experience? And like, yeah. And they can talk about it in a way that shows that transferable skills for them. So I think it's like the the benefits for the students go beyond the classroom, mm -hmm. certainly. Well, and with um, the American Association of Colleges and Universities has a published list of high impact practices. And we see gains in student retention, performance, graduation through participation in any one of these. But newer research has shown that there's actually a cumulative effect that when you stack these experiences, when a student has study abroad, first year experience, experiential learning, living learning communities, all of these things have uh, increased benefits when uh, compared to students who have one or even fewer of these uh, in a comparison group. And so we're, we're able to see that, that participation to show that uh, not only do we see that these are experiences that match up with the kind of uh, education we want to provide, we know that that education has returns. It really feels like a recipe for success, like the program itself, like all those little parts that help students succeed, like a living community, living learning community, um, when they're, like you said, stacked all together, it like promotes success down the line. Is it like student. tapas? Yeah, a little <laughs> bit of a tap, yeah, perfect. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Um, and, and in particular, I do think it is especially worth highlighting uh, that that research shows that those gains are particularly beneficial, that we see greater leaps for first-generation students and from students of other underrepresented backgrounds. So what are the offices that, that support this program? This has been a campus-wide effort um, and I think really speaks to the collaboration uh, that I've really enjoyed in my time at AU um, and that shows the ways in which working together can actually lift up all of our offices um, in really key ways. So AU Abroad is obviously involved. I what? Think. <laughs> Go figure. I think we've talked a lot about just the profound experience that the Madrid staff have and how they are so um, built into this experience for the students and they really set the tone for students as they start their AU experience. So, but just to provide a little bit more about, okay, like what does the DC team here do? Because, you know, we're not in Madrid, but I think of it as we're setting them up to get there, right? Like we have to do everything that we can to support students sort of along the journey of getting to the AU Madrid Center. So a lot of it is like the administrative 
operations of the program, coordinating and having collaboration uh, between the AU Madrid Center and our campus partners. So whether that's SIS, UEAS, it's working together to make sure that there's really clear communication, really clear expectations at our center and then with our partners. So it's really get the students there so that they can thrive. We're working with lots of offices, like I mentioned. Um, and then importantly, it's serving kind of as a guide. You know, we advise our students all the time at AU Abroad on our programs, but the level of advising for this program is different. Um, it's really guiding students and their families um, as they start the process, right? From the very first, maybe like, time they check a box that says, I think I might be interested in this to like the 10th email they send about the visa. Like we're there for all of that portion and making sure that they know that we're supporting them along the way and what that support network will look like once they arrive in Madrid. And just briefly, so everyone knows the wonderful people that I keep referencing in Madrid. This is um, Ava Garcia, who's our assistant director. She works with the scholars, um, the Madrid SIS scholars. She's kind of like their beacon while they're there on the program and helps with guide them um, and is just you know, their resource and their touch point while they're there. I mentioned our program assistant, Adele. Um, she is really able to you know, help the students in their living community, able to sort of guide them through some of the cultural transitions as a student who has take who has dual citizenship. She's very familiar with you know some of the cultural differences between the US and Spain. And so really helps students bridge that gap. Um, Isabel is our safe space coordinator. She is a licensed therapist. She's really kind of that first line for students, whether it's I think I'm a little homesick or I'm not quite sure like what I'm feeling. They just want someone to check in with. They have that, that resource there. And then finally, Paco Gomez, who is our AU Madrid director, he really oversees all the academics, the programming. Um, Paco's like fingerprint and magic is all over AU Madrid and this program. And so students are really lucky to have this team with them. And then the office that I work with, Office of Undergraduate Education and Academic Student Services, uh, has been the home at American University for both our general education program as well as our living learning communities. And so in partnering with AU Abroad, have been able to uh, surface the qualities of, of the lived experience on campus as well as the academics to make sure that there's a seamless year-long uh, foundation to what we've designed. So working with colleagues in first-year advising to ensure that uh, uh, little things like um, making sure that uh, they're not included in in communications uh, to then coordinating with with our colleagues in the School of International Service to ensure that because they're not being advised by the first year advisors, how does that happen in conjunction with with SIS? And so working on all of those pieces and in, in particular thinking about how do we not only think about just their first year, but making sure they're set up for the second, third, and fourth year. In addition to uh, uh, sort of our two offices, we also have the Office of Undergraduate Admissions. Yes, so this is a great example of where collaboration has kind of blossomed for our office at AU Abroad. Like we have been working with undergraduate admissions, you know, to recruit for the program and make sure people know about the program. Um, so whether it's doing preview days, meeting with potential students who are interested in it, um, having undergraduate admissions sort of let us know, hey, a student check that box that said, I'm considering this program or I would like to learn more. Uh, undergraduate admissions looks at the applicant pool and kind of says like, hey, we've identified some students that seem like they could be a really great fit for your program. And so they coordinate with us to um, sort of let us know like students we should keep an eye on and then students that we can start really engaging with to help them get excited and learn more about the process. And of course, there are some things we have to consider when you're sending students abroad so early in their academic careers. And one of them is age because there's visa constraints. And so they also help us make sure that the profile of the student matches what we need from like a legal perspective for the visa so that no one's like hopes and dreams are crushed when we tell them, oh, actually you, you're not old enough to go. <laughs> And then, yeah, SIS and AU Abroad have always been really meaningful partners. We have a significant connection. You know, so many SIS students go abroad and are able to have an international experience. We were really lucky that from the very beginning, 
um, SIS, you know, supported housing this program uh, within their school. Dean Shinko went uh, prior to the program starting, you know, a year out to really look at like, the logistics of the program, um, what that launch would look like, really to ensure that the values and the academic foundations of SIS were carried through for students. So again, there didn't feel like a huge abrupt shift in like the tone of the academics um, when students arrived back on campus. And they worked really closely with on-site staff to make sure courses lined up with the SIS um, majors, like the, all those foundation courses that students need to take. And again, we worked with the core to make sure that the courses for the core, um, that students had options for creative aesthetic inquiry and socio. Um, historical inquiry. So a lot of um, work together academically and also like Brad was saying, they're not advised by first year advisors. And so figuring out, you know, how do we engage with them from an advising perspective and the director of undergraduate advising, Matt, has taken the lead on that, provided a lot of extra support for our students. Brad mentioned earlier, some of them are very high achieving academically. They're coming with lots of AP credits, IB. And so figuring out how we can serve them best and make sure that they're challenged and excited about the coursework and make adjustments based on their needs. Okay, everyone's favorite topic, right? The financial aspect. Um, AU is really unique in the sense that for any AU abroad program, not just this wonderful program, um, students, their institutional aid from AU follows them. So if it's a grant, a scholarship, aid they receive through the FAFSA, and that doesn't change on this program. Oftentimes, when you're thinking about selling the program, parents, that's sort of their first one of their first concerns, right? Besides the fact that my child's like across an ocean, maybe, it's the fact they're like, school's expensive and just getting our kid to DC feels a little overwhelming. How does now going across an ocean add to that? But because your financial aid follows you, it's like if you can do a semester in DC, like we can get you can get to Madrid probably. And so helping parents and students, but mostly parents and families realize that is really important. Um, AU Abroad also provides additional um, $500 scholarships to students who are Pell eligible on top of a $1,500 grant that was given to students that were participating in this program. And then lastly, the Division of Student Affairs. So uh, as I said, as we've said multiple times, this is a campus-wide effort and in uh, figuring out all of the logistics, all of the details of the program, have have learned all of the ways in which these uh, small ideas touch on every bit of the operations of the university. Um, and Division of Student Affairs was impacted just the same. So as two examples of this, the, the Office of Housing and Residence Life provides support to these students because they are coming into our residence halls when they come to campus in the spring. And so we had to be sure that we were able to accommodate them uh, when that happened and to do so within our university college uh, living learning community because we wanted to provide that uh, setting for students to be able to reintegrate into the community and to meet other students who are already part of a, a living learning program. And there was also, of course, then these details of they formed relationships. Can we accommodate roommate requests if they wish to live with each other? Conversely, we wouldn't have wanted to make an, a decision on the student's behalf to say you must all live together. And so figuring out those logistics to figure, to determine where there are rooms, uh, what are the arrangements of those rooms uh, was a detail that we worked through uh, with the, the good partnership of our colleagues in the Division of Student Affairs. And then also to think about what does that transition look like? There are so many uh, points where these students are experiencing handoffs uh, handoffs from admissions to uh, AU abroad, um, from AU abroad to Madrid, AU Madrid from yes. UAS to and and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the first experiences that these students have, if they're coming to campus as regular first time first year students, is new student orientation. We're all preparing for that uh, here in a few short days. Uh, but these students don't have a same, the same need for the same kind of new student orientation. There are aspects of this that are appropriate for these students as a first time, first semester college student, even though they'll be at a different site, but there are some that are different and there are some that are delayed. And so we've been able to work with new student orientation and continue to work with them to determine what's the best delivery at the right moments and in what ways uh, we can do that most seamlessly. So we, 
have hinted along the way to some of the challenges. And I even think I would reframe these as just like details to work out. Um, nothing that we've experienced along the way with perhaps maybe the exception of uh, the embassy continuously <laughs> giving this team, this wonderful team headaches. Uh, nothing has been insurmountable. <laughs> insurmountable. And I think that really speaks to the expertise and the uh, experience that each of the offices who are involved in this program has. So a couple that we'll talk about. Yeah, recruitment. <laughs> sort of the first big challenge, I would say. You know, AU abroad is really lucky because having an international experience is so much like part of the fabric of AU. And, you know, we're ranked number two in, in the nation for study abroad. So usually, um, students sort of seek us out. They've come to AU to have that experience. Um, or really, you know, our best advertising for our semester-long programs is our alumni. Like, they really engage with their fellow Eagles and let them know about our experiences. We didn't have that for this program. There were no alumni. Um, so for us, it was a different kind of recruitment process. Um, and it could be a hard sell, right? Like I said earlier, a lot of parents are like, I'm saying goodbye to my child sort of for the first time to go and be an independent student, it feels even further if it is further away, but it feels like such a big leap to go abroad in that first semester. And I think what we did was really just acknowledge that for students and parents. Um, we didn't shy away from the fact that it is a unique program. It's not gonna be a program that works for every single person and that's okay. There are gonna be lots of other opportunities to engage with an international experience with AU abroad throughout your time at AU. But for the students that were excited about it, and some right away were like, yes, this is for me. Others were like cautiously curious. They expressed interest, like their ears kind of perked up, but they weren't sure about it. And so it was just meeting students where they're at and acknowledging that like, there's going to be challenges. There's challenges whenever you go abroad, but here are some of the ones that would be really unique as a first year student. So just having like that, those honest conversations, engaging with parents and families at a different level than we're used to um, when we're doing work with our upper uh, class students. And so um, I think that technique of just being really honest and um, answering questions as it came along was helpful. I think at this point, we also really need to give a shout out to our colleague, Courtney Glover, who is joining us on Zoom. We didn't get a chance to introduce earlier. She is the associate director um, for the AU Centers Abroad and really has been like a foundational element to getting this program started. She has provided a level of guidance that sort of goes beyond our typical advising as AU abroad advisor. So she's really working with students from, I said, that very first point of contact all the way through to when they land in Madrid and beyond. And so I think that level of engagement that she's been able to provide, what it does is it shows parents and families, again, even students, but really important their loved ones, just like the network of support that they can expect when they're at AU. And I think that sort of eases them in and they're able to release a lot of their fears because along the way we are being so engaged throughout the process. So the secret to recruiting for this program has really been being upfront and open about some of the challenges, but then also engaging with parents, families, and loved ones on a different level so they can see an example of the support that's going to be available to their students. The families have been really astonished when Amazing. they sign on to a Zoom or when they come to an event at AU and Courtney knows who they are and knows their student's name. And they and, know Courtney. <laughs> and they know Courtney. And, and I think that that is one of the benefits of a university of AU's size and of the size of this program is that we're able to meet that kind of yeah, uh, so you in tune in a, on a personal level with each individual applicant you might not get um, somewhere else. One of the harder challenges conversion-wise has been our visa process, which can be hard to explain, but um, applying for a visa is an intricate process. And typically we're so lucky to be in DC and our um, students who, who go um, as, you know, their third or fourth year students abroad, we have just have them apply to the DC consulate. We have a great working relationship. Um, because our students are so geographically diverse, um, some of them are applying in San Francisco, Chicago, Boston. We have had to learn the visa process for each of these uh, consulates and it can be very unique. And so um, Courtney and I have spent a lot of time learning a lot of different sort of rules about the application process. 
for some students, applying for that visa can feel like a really big barrier. And so again, just providing that level of um, personalized experience, depending on where the student lives, what some of their fears are. Some students have never interacted with that level of bureaucracy before, and their parents haven't either. So just being there for them throughout that process so that they don't feel like that is a roadblock that stops them from committing to the program. Mental health, we talked, it's been talked about a little bit today at other sessions. It's a really important um, element of the student experience. Our on-site staff in Madrid are obviously very well versed in um, supporting students holistically, including their well-being, their, their mental health while they're abroad. Um, but the challenges that come with the first year experience are a little bit different than the older students. But because our team had that foundation, they're able to you know, um, adjust the framework to fit the first year students. Um, students don't have the same access to some of the resources they have on campus. Now, for our first year students who haven't been to campus, that causes less um, concern or maybe challenges to some of the students who are really used to the wonderful services that are available on campus. Um, so students come into the experience knowing that because of licensing issues and different laws around therapy, it's not gonna be the same as if they were in the US or in DC. That being said, I mentioned Isabel earlier, who's our safe space coordinator. She is a licensed therapist and like I said, she's the first person that students can go to as a confidential resource to discuss how they're feeling. You know, sometimes it's just, I miss my mom <laughs> and I just wanna tell someone and I don't know these students well enough to admit that yet. And sometimes it's a little more, you know, complex. Maybe a student is like, I'm not sure that my medication is working the same way. I don't know where to go next. And that's where Isabel can really help point them in the right direction. She can also make sure if they need care or continuation of care um, to refer them. We also work very closely with the Office of Global Safety to make sure students have all the information they need in terms of where they go for mental health resources on top of, of course, physical health resources. So the transition back to campus, I think one of the um, elements of the program that continues to, to need further refinement is that that handoff between their semester abroad and, and their return or their first arrival on campus here at AU. Uh, the fall 24 cohort, our first cohort, indicated that this was challenging for them socially. Um, and I think that this is, is a complex it's a complex problem, as, as so many things are, where uh, we're coming off the tail of, of some of the, the uh, social challenges post-COVID in all students' behaviors, but in particular thinking about what the uh, experience is of, of the students who felt like uh, they worried that they were missing out on something that their peers had, had gotten in that first semester. And so normalizing and, and regularizing some of, of that uh, I think is is one of our our sort of uh, more amorphous challenges and goals. Um, but one of the things that we can think about in in particular is how do we recreate some of those firsts for these students once they arrive on campus um, and making some of those adjustments uh, so that they feel as though uh, they're having uh, that traditional first time uh, residential experience uh, that other students are. Um, for example, with orientation, thinking about how do we adjust that experience, which otherwise is, is a very sort of off cycle one for AU generally, because we bring in so few first year students, uh, but recognizing that these aren't first year students either. So it isn't just as simple as grafting on to the work that, that has been done for an orientation of a first time first year student in the spring. These students have experiences. How can we draw upon the experience that AU Abroad has of bringing uh, students who are coming to AU as uh, away uh, from their own institutions um, and studying here. Um, so we're going to shift into some successes then, uh, because I do think actually these things go really hand in hand. Um, so high student satisfaction with the program. Uh, this is a cohort that has really bonded um, in ways that surprised me in some ways, you, you know, um, and I, I think what I am most impressed with upon hearing the reflections of the team who worked with them is how much they looked after one another um, and sort of sought that out. Um, so uh, I'll just read this quote aloud. Uh, the program bonds you with the people around you and as freshmen having that tight knit group can be impactful 
Studying in Madrid is adventurous, but it is not an opportunity be, to be missed. It will give you a new lease on life and you get to engage with people from different backgrounds while adjusting to college life. Uh, group trips and paseos are ways students will engage with Spain and its history and culture. And the student is, is really nicely integrating all of the aspects of their experience in ways that demonstrate to me that this is uh, deep learning that they've experienced because they're forming those connections of what those component parts are that made for it to be a good experience. Yeah, this next student, I, I think really speaks to what I've sort of been saying across the presentation, the idea that the experience can be daunting as the student says, but it can feel in a lot of ways, just like another first semester experience because of that level of support that students are getting. So, um, you know, they're so bonded together and they're able to, the daunting part of it, I think sort of as they get used to the experience and they're there, that goes away. And what they're really able to focus on is like, yeah, I am a first semester college student and I'm getting these really amazing opportunities through group trips and excursions. Um, the deep learning that Brad mentioned, like there's like an academic component to that. And there's also like a life skill component to that. And I think some of the, the most impactful feedback that I've just seen from students is like, oh, they're a little bit, they've come out of it with like some life skills about how they connect with other people, you know, how they take on challenges. And they learn so much about themselves, even outside of like that academic component that is obviously a main part of the program. Um, and certainly uh, reflecting on, on the worthwhileness, the appreciation for and, and uh, deep and sort of rich value of an international education. Um, I think that studying abroad has opened my eyes and mind to the way that other people live. Um, this uh, sort of communication across difference um, and sort of respect for diverse perspectives is one of the things that we focus on hear a lot uh, in the AU core curriculum, but being able to take that out of the classroom context, see it in the world, and, and find uh, the ways in which that that changes your approach in a, in a space and in, a, in time, I think is, is um, uh, heartening to me <laughs> in, this, in this particular moment. Yeah, and I love this student when you're talking about like changing their approach to life, or like what I've been saying, helping them feel confident to go after, you know, their dreams in a sense of students saying like, I'm not limited after this to a job in DC or even the United States. Like this experience has given them the confidence to think broadly about how they can fit in to a global context. I mean, <laughs> I mean, yeah, it was a, it was a good year for the students, like very exciting. So after the first semester or the first full year for this cohort, the average GPA was a 3.57, uh, which is good. <laughs> um, and the students, you know, continued to be enrolled in courses that, you know, applied to their majors in the AU core. Um, and so basically the program did what it was supposed to do. It set them up for the being able to continue with that foundation that we built during that first semester. And yes, we have already heard from a number of the fall 23 cohort. Um, I've met with some of them who are like, I want to go back to Spain. I loved it so much. Like, what, what can I do next? We're meeting with students who are interested in um, having an experience. They're like, I really started working on my Spanish in um, Madrid. I want to try in Latin America now and have that cross-cultural dynamic. So we're seeing students, like again, being bold, thinking about how they can continue to expand their network and their experience. And a lot of that comes from the fact that they were able to do this program, which really set them up to know what, what is possible as an AU student. And when we first envisioned the program, we had had in mind uh, a four-year trajectory for these students. We wanted these students to, to study abroad in their first semester, but then also to go abroad another place or to return to Spain. Um, we had we had visions of, of different kinds of uh, cohorted classes here on campus. And I think this is one of the uh, reflections that I have uh, from the program is recognizing uh, that the students will show us the ways in which they want to take this experience forward and that we can open up those pathways for them um, if we listen to that feedback. So some of those takeaways then, and I think that sets us up nicely for it. Um, so as we sort of like draw to a close, 
um, what to think about the ways in which, uh, in particular, communication and collaboration. Uh, this would not happen without those, uh, those sort of like continual uh, um, sort of efforts at making sure that we understand uh, what each of us needs and what each of us has taken on responsibility for. Um, we are um, almost like every other day, I feel like in some form or fashion talking with one another. And I think it also allows us to have an even, even deeper appreciation for our colleagues and our cross-campus collaborations that happen and really being able to see people lean into their expertise. And when you have to go ask another office, like, how how do you start like an orientation on campus? Like, what does that look like? Or how does how do students get placed in counseling that second semester? You really see how invested and how um, deeply other offices uh, care about the students. And again, like that level of expertise and to be able to like tap into that for this program across different units has been, it's been fun. And it's like, you know, it's nice to have colleagues and <laughs> that you can do that with. Well, and I think that too, as we think about the, the process of developing a program like this one is in some ways taking the student experience, which uh, is always at the center of this work and, and beginning to map out what are all of the, the places at the university that it touches, what are all the moments in this, and recognizing that as we work through iterations of this program, that we're learning better what each of us does bring to it. And, and also then recognizing when is something central to the mission of an office and when isn't it. We spoke earlier about the work of the, the first year advising team versus the unit based advising team. And that was a, a, a design change where we had to reflect upon uh, who is sort of best positioned to support those students uh, within the structures that we already have in place, recognizing that they already have supports for uh, another special program which they uh, support in the same way. And so this, it just made sense. It's like very thoughtful collaboration. Yeah. Yeah, so the student experience. Um, the fall cohort that the first initial one in 23 was given uh, several opportunities to provide feedback to engage with us and let us know um, sort of what their, their takeaways were for the program. Um, one thing that really came out of there is that students said that they wanted to the future cohort to be in a sheltered AUX session. Um, they have a really unique experience together. And I think we were really thinking like, okay, we gotta get them back on campus, make sure they're having chances to engage with other members of the community. But they were sort of like, hey, we also need time to still be together in our cohort. They valued each other so much. It was such a safe space for them already that we, went, we realized that we couldn't take that not away from them really, they mm -hmm. needed more opportunities. They needed more opportunities to engage um, together in that way. And Brad mentioned there were some transitional issues. Yeah. <laughs> and so we'll work through those again. And I know that in the interest of time, I do wanna leave at least a couple of moments for your questions. So we'll sort of just like rapidly move through <laughs> a couple of these other pieces. Um, yeah, so this program first started with 15 students. Uh, we were aiming for 2025, so we we're a little bit below, but this year, I think this really speaks to the fact that we have a really strong alumni base now. We were able to get 21 students, um, and then we actually had so much interest, it exceeded what we were able to house at our partner for this semester. So again, the alum alumni factor, I don't think you can count that out. It's made a big difference in recruiting for the fall 24. And then just to summarize, again, it's, it's that collaboration. It is so key, and the, the sort of like, thoughtful respect for and an openness to receiving that expertise that each other has to offer. Um, I think when in doubt, uh, just starting to talk with one another is the place yeah, to begin. When in doubt, reach out. <laughs> it's hard yeah. how it's worked for us. Um, Want to thank you all for joining us. Would love, I know we only have a couple of minutes, but happy to stick around even a couple of minutes longer, uh, but would love to hear your reactions, your questions. Um, All right. Well, hearing none and reading none, I think I've got the chat open. I want to thank you again, all. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Brad. All right. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. We loved it. Thank you. No, no.